Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for attending this evening. I'm Dr. Kirsten Rowling. I'm the Chief Education Officer here at Dental CE Academy. And tonight we have a tremendous presentation by Dr. Robert Coltz, the Clinical Director on behalf of Overjet. His presentation will be from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific time, followed by a product demonstration presented by Sydney Chick, Account Executive for Overjet. Important, we want to remind everyone for a stellar experience, be sure to use Chrome browser. If you need tech support, please let us know by typing in the chat area. Be sure to follow the instructions that we have posted in the chat area as well for you and download the course folder and CE credit instructions. You will see that link in the orange box in the instruction area. At 635, all attendees will receive an email from us Dental CE Academy to complete a brief quiz for CE credit. In addition, instructions were emailed to all of you prior to 4 p.m. Pacific time. I am very excited and honored to introduce Dr. Robert Colts and Overjet to all of you this evening, and we would like to express our gratitude to Overjet for sponsoring this presentation in order for 1,000 of you to register and learn about artificial intelligence in dentistry. Also, we want to be sure that you stay on for Sydney Chick's presentation uh, for special pricing to all attendees. So Dr. Colts, I will now turn over the virtual podium to you and thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowling and the Dental Seed Academy for having me. Really appreciate all of you for logging in tonight. I recognize for those who are watching me live, that I'm competing with not one, but two Monday night football games. So I appreciate you letting me be at least one of the things that you're watching this evening. Um, and I know I'm really excited to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, that's artificial intelligence in dentistry and how this is really impacting dental practices, our patients, and really helping elevate us as clinicians. Um, so just by way of introduction, introduction, excuse me, so you know who you're speaking with tonight. My name is Dr. Colts. I am the clinical director of Overjet. Uh, Overjet is the industry leader in diagnostic artificial intelligence. My background has been both as a restorative dentist and a DSO executive uh, over the last decade. So excited to spend uh, a few minutes with you guys this evening. So what I'd like to start is just, uh, I'm going to give you all a promotion. I recognize that we have a range of people on this webinar uh, this evening, both from doctors, hygienists, assistants, uh, treatment coordinators, front desk staff. I know we've got the whole office here uh, potentially. But for now, I'm gonna elevate all of you to be dentists. You now have a uh, artificial DDS degree or DMD that you get to use. So I want you to take just a moment and look at this radiograph. And I want you to think in your mind, what would you treatment plan given this x-ray? Okay, I promise whatever you treatment plan, no harm will come to this patient. Uh, so just take a look at this x-ray and, and just think about what you see. Okay? Do you see bone loss on this x-ray? Do you see caries on this x-ray? Do you see calculus on this x-ray? And if you see those things, how much bone loss, if any, do you think there is? How large is the caries that you're seeing? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to overlay the artificial intelligence on top of this radiograph. And I want you to think, how did this change your experience? If you're looking at and evaluating this radiograph now, does this change the experience that you had evaluating that last radiograph? Now. For the, the dentists and many of you who are not dentists, even on the call, you can recognize that there was some caries on this patient, okay? that there are some interproximal lesions. Um, you know, the, the bone loss is a little bit more interesting. Did you think this patient had bone loss? And now that you have the AI on the radiograph, do you think that this patient has bone loss? Um, and so as we go through the presentation, I want to give you some uh, idea of how you can use this information in your diagnostic process, and then also how you can use this information to communicate to your patient. And just to give you the background on this patient, just because I'm a dentist and I'm OCD and I like to know everything about the x-rays I'm looking at. This is a 17-year-old patient who just got her uh, braces off, never had a cavity in her life. The mom's super proud that, oh, yay, my daughter's all done with uh, braces. And then this is the x-ray that we present with. So keep that in the back of your mind while we go through. We'll talk a little bit about case presentation here in a, in a few minutes. So what we're going to talk today is really understanding artificial intelligence, how it works, what its capabilities and limitations are. The reason we start with that is I think it's really informative for you to understand how the models are created. Because if you understand how the AI model is generated, I think you'll understand and appreciate a little bit more of what it can do for you 
as well as maybe what it can't do for you and how you need to continue with your diagnostic process. And you don't let it slip because you're using AI. If anything, you're going to elevate your diagnostic process by using it. Uh, we'll re review some case studies. We're going to talk about uh, clinical consistency with AI. We'll talk a little bit of, at the end about how insurance payers and companies are using artificial intelligence. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming down the pipeline in AI and how things are going to change over the next six months and, and even the next year or two. So the way artificial intelligence works is it takes an x-ray that is never seen before and it annotates it the way that it thinks a dentist would have annotated that x-ray. And the reason it can do that is because it's trained with specific machine learning models that are, that are specifically trained to recognize certain things. So for instance, one model might recognize caries, one might recognize calculus, one might recognize what we call key points, which is CEJ points and bone points. One might recognize existing restorations, root canal obturations, uh, pulp space, um, a, a whole host of other things. And then it takes the aggregate output from those machine learning models and it overlays the output on top of that radiograph. Now, let's take a step back just for one moment and let's talk about how AI works just in general. So I'm gonna put this picture back up. This is the picture from my introductory slide. And it may surprise you to know, or maybe it won't, that I have no idea where this photo was taken. I've never worn this suit before. I should get a suit like that because I think it looks pretty nice, but this is not an actual photograph of myself. Um, it almost fooled my wife, not quite. She did ask me who took that and where were you for this photo, mostly because she's probably wondering where I got that suit from. Um, but the reality is this, this image that you're seeing here is created by artificial intelligence. And the way that it was created is I used this service and I uploaded 12 photos of myself. That was the minimum requirement. 12 photos of myself so that the machine learning model could generate an idea or create an idea of what I look like. And then based off of those 12 images, it created about 15 to 20 images that it thought looked like me. I thought this was the one that looked most like me. It's not perfect. Uh, I think this picture probably looks better than I do in real life. Uh, and that's why I like to use it. Um, but no, th this is a process called generative AI. So this is creating something uh, de novo, something brand new based off of its learning. So that is different than the way that AI is used in our application. Hey, we're not using generative AI. We're not creating something from nothing. What we are doing is teaching the, the AI and the ML models to recognize what is there and label it accordingly. Okay, so there are a lot of different kinds of AI that are out there. Those are using ChatGPT, that's a generative AI as well. Um, but we're gonna talk about how we can use computer vision and how we can use that to, to help us with our diagnostic process. So let's talk for a moment just about AI in general. Let's take, a, take maybe one step past that and talk about machine learning. So machine learning is the mechanism by which AI models are trained. And what I mean by that is it's a set of algorithms or data points or associations that the, that the machine learning application creates. Now, they can go from very simple to very complex. So let's use a simple concept just to start. So for instance, let's say we wanted to create a machine learning program that could recognize if there was a square on an image. So you're giving it a, a series of shapes and it's gonna tell you which ones are square. So what we could do in this case is we could actually manually define the features. And what I mean is we could create kind of a, a flow chart that says, if you see a shape that is closed, so all the sides touch, that have four equal sides and there's four angles of 90 degrees, then we will say that that is yes, that is a square. Okay, so then we can create that model and feed it a host of images and it'll, it'll be uh, probably close to 100% accurate. Still probably not 100%, but darn close. All right, well, that one's easy because we can define a square reasonably, right? I think all of us could have come up with that definition. But what if you want to teach it something that is maybe a little bit more challenging? What if you wanted to recognize if there's a dog in an image? Now, I don't know about you, but there, there are some general things I could describe about a dog, but it would be very hard to, to describe to it all the features of dogs because they come in various sizes, various shapes, uh, various colors. Um, you know, they do look and have some similar features to cats and other animals. So how do you teach this model? Well, what you do is instead of defining all the characteristics you're looking for, you feed it enough data and you let it analyze the features and come up with its own associations. So what that means is as you feed it more images and you say, yes, this one has a dog or no, this one doesn't have a dog, it begins to recognize on its own what associations it needs to create to become uh, accurate and correctly label images with dogs. So, all right, let's bring it back to dentistry. How does this work in, inside the realm of what we're doing in diagnosis? 
So we used that deep learning model, that, that same model that we talked about with the dogs, where we feed enough data so that the models themselves can begin to recognize what is on the image. Now, we do help it a little bit more. Rather than just saying this x-ray has caries and this one doesn't have caries, we use what's called a supervised learning process. What that means is that we feed fully annotated data into the models, such as what you see here on the left, where the features on the radiograph have been labeled by licensed dentists. So the dentists highlight areas where there are caries, where there's existing restorations, where there's pulp, enamel, DEJ points, bone points. And all of those labeled data points then feed into the model. So now the model knows not only is there caries on this image, but this is exactly where a dentist thinks there is caries. Okay. Now, dentists uh, struggle to agree. I don't know if you guys have experienced this in your practice, but sometimes we struggle to agree on what's caries and what's not. Uh, and so because we're trained by dentists, it means we inherit some of those, those innate challenges that we as dentists have, and that's variability between, between observers. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we can help overcome some of that. But now that we've fed this model annotated data, and I don't mean a dozen images or a hundred images, we're talking millions of clinical data points, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of x-rays and counting. We continually feed more data to these models to continually improve them. But now that we've created these models and the models have generated their own associations of which we don't truly know what associations it's building, we can only measure the accuracy. We can feed it an x-ray that it's never seen before, have it go through the machine learning models and have it accurately predict the way that it thinks a dentist would have annotated that x-ray. Now it's very specific in the word choice I use there. Okay, I did not say it will tell you where caries is. I did not say it's going to diagnose periodontal disease. Okay, what I said it's going to do is it's going to accurately predict to the best of its ability, the way that a dentist would have annotated that image. Okay, if you think about it, the AI does not know what caries is. It does not know the bacterial etiology. It does not know uh, the cause of periodontal disease. All it knows is that when there's a change in radio density of an image in a specific location to a certain degree that dentists tend to annotate it as caries. It, it recognizes that the, the bright white line on the outer portion of a, of a tooth, dentists label as enamel. And so when it's, it's reading an x-ray it's never seen before, it will label those areas as enamel or existing restorations, okay? And so as you're reviewing the, the AI annotations on an x-ray, it's important to note that what you see here on this image is exceptionally helpful. It can guide you, it can make you faster, it can make you more accurate, but what it is not doing is diagnosing for you. As clinicians, you have the ultimate control over what you treatment plan and what you do, what you don't treatment plan. You should never feel guilty for not treatment planning something that AI annotated or for treatment planning something that AI didn't annotate. Essentially, you can think of this as the, the ultimate uh, you know, asking your, your closest 100 friends uh, that are dentists what they would think about this x-ray. And what we have found through our extensive training and FDA clearances is that we are nearing single, a single clinician level accuracy on reviewing these x-rays. Um, so with this, there's a lot of capabilities that we're able to, to create. And we are uh, talking specifically about Overjet just for a moment. It is an FDA approved artificial intelligence platform. And I wanna talk about that just, just for a moment. We are FDA approved for caries detection on bite wings and PAs. We have FDA approval for our bone level measurements and for our calculus detection. We are also FDA approved as a concurrent or a first read device. And this is important, I like to bring this up. What that means is that the FDA says, you can use us with these images, with the AI turned on to help you guide your diagnosis. Okay, there are some platforms out there that are, that are labeled as a second read device, meaning technically, if you're following the FDA, you have to review the images first without the AI. And then after you've come up with your diagnosis, turn on the AI to determine if you feel like you are accurate with your diagnosis. But it's a high bar to be labeled as a concurrent read device. And so we're very proud of the fact that we are listed as a concurrent read device. So let's talk about some features, some things that AI can do uh, that, that are, in my opinion, really fascinating. So the first thing that it can do is provide quantification for things that were previously a little subjective. So let's look at this panoramic image just for a moment. So what's happening here is this, this is the uh, Overjet's AI platform looking at a panoramic image specifically for third molars. And okay. so before the way we look at third molars is that we look at it and say that looks like it's mostly uh, impacted or that looks like it's partially impacted or all the way or that one looks erupted. But it's really hard to tell truly how much to what percentage or degree the impaction was. 
Well, now using the benefits of artificial intelligence, we can label the subcrestal portion of the tooth, the portion of the tooth that's outside or appears to be outside the alveolar crest. And then we can do the math and have an have a exact percentage in two dimensions, of course, because that's what we're looking at here, of the impaction level on these teeth. And so you can see over here on the right sidebar, it's listing number one is impacted 71%, 16 at 69%, 72 and 100. And so uh, what this does now is it can give you a, a higher level of uh, consistency as you're reviewing radiographs. If you're a general dentist who does some but not all third molars, you could, you could use that to help uh, recognize cases that you want to do versus ones that you feel like you should, you should refer. Or you can use that to guide your decision on billing if how you're going to submit this to insurance based off of that percentage. And we'll talk a little bit more about insurance at the end. So we can also use this to help us identify pathologies. Okay, so for example, identifying uh, root canal obturations and fillings, and then even detecting periodical radiolucencies. So this is a model of ours that is under FDA review at the moment. And you can see here on the distal of that molar, we've got a periapical radiolucency detected. Now this happens automatically. And this is really the benefit of artificial intelligence is there's no button you have to click or, or like you're not dragging and dropping this to an upload service and then waiting. As soon as you take the radiograph, it's uploaded, annotated within 90 seconds or less. So we call that near real time with these findings. Now periapical radiolucencies specifically tend to be one of the most missed features on radiographs because they are typically incidental findings. Right, unless, unless the patient's coming in with pain and you're specifically, specifically taking that PA to see if that tooth has an infection, uh, a lot of times these are incidental on a full mouth series of x-rays. And that's not to say that every single one of them is going to need root canal or extraction or implant or things like that. But now we can detect them more completely, more accurately, and maybe we're following the size and the, and the progression and the healing of these features. And so this can be a really impactful way to really help us be more objective as we're reviewing these radiographs and really more consistent as well. So now let's talk about uh, how artificial intelligence can impact our diagnostic accuracy and how it can help us be more consistent. So for this, I wanna reference a study that came out in 2019. And this is one that I think is, is really fascinating. And I looked at the impact that time pressure had on a clinician's ability to detect uh, radiographic features, specifically caries, then periodontal related findings. And what they did in this study is they took a group of dentists and they split them into two cohorts. And with one cohort, they gave them unlimited time, take whatever you need, uh, review these radiographs and come up with a treatment plan. What would you diagnose for each of these radiographs? And for the other cohort, they gave them simulated time pressure. And what that means is in this particular study, there was a computer program with like a countdown timer in the upper right corner that cycled down and counted down for about 30 seconds or so for each of these images to simulate time pressure. And then they had to review the x-rays and come up with their treatment plan. And what they found is that dentists under time pressure diagnosed on average 40% less radiographic findings than dentists who did not have time pressure. And th these weren't like a group of, of new doctors either where you would expect that that's the case. I think the average year of experience in this study was like 17 years on these dentists, okay? So what, in your practice would this do? And, and think in the practice that you work in, have you ever had a diagnostic experience or has your doctor done an exam not under time pressure? If you have an office like that, are they hiring? Because I would love to have that exam experience. Uh, I, I can't think of a time that I've ever had a non-time pressure bound exam. And, and I like to think I'm not an average dentist and I assume you know half of us in here at least are not average dentists if we go by probabilities. And so I'd like to think I don't miss or diagnose 40% less, but even if it's 20% less or 15% less, I mean, that, there's still an amount that we know because of human error and split attention that we are diagnosing, uh, I don't wanna say poorly, but at least less than we could have, less comprehensively. Um, and really when we're talking about diagnostics, it's not the quantity of the diagnostic that matters, at least in my mind, it's the quality of the diagnostics. And except for in some very rare circumstances, I find that overdiagnosis is very rarely the problem in dentistry. If you survey your patients, they might think that that's the issue. But if you look at the actual data, overdiagnosis is very, very rarely the problem in, in dentistry. It's almost always under less comprehensive diagnosis. And so well, as we're going through, you'll see how artificial intelligence can help impact that. So let's take a break for a moment. Let's look at a couple of examples because I think it's interesting to see uh, annotated radiographs and then compare with the unannotated. 
So I want to start first with this set of radiographs. Okay, now this set of X-rays is actually sent to us by a, uh, a large DSO. And the backstory is uh, they, they weren't customers of ours at the time, but they wanted to see how the AI would, would have annotated these. And the reason for that was is they had a younger dentist who diagnosed a handful of restorations on this patient. And the patient was very upset and said that you're overdiagnosing and you're all about the money and how dare you. So they wanted to see if we had AI, why we were having this diagnostic process, would have that provided some buffer and some more confidence for this younger doctor? And so as I'm talking, hopefully you've been looking at this x-ray. I recognize they're small, I apologize. But just look for yourself and determine where are some areas that you think there's some interproximal lesions, okay? Are there some that need treatment? Are there some that don't need treatment? Um, and, and then I'm gonna flip to the next x-ray here and let's see how the AI annotated this. So what we have here is the fully annotated version. So let me walk you through all the different colors and things that we're seeing here. Okay, now the blue is existing restorations. So we see at least one crown in there, uh, several fillings. Some of those could be in laser on laser potentially, but uh, I'm gonna assume those are composites. And, and those are in blue. We've got some green lines next to all the teeth with one dot on the CEJ and the other dot on the crest of bone. And there's a, a number next to those lines. Those numbers units are in millimeters. Okay, and these numbers are accurate, plus or minus three tenths of a millimeter. And we know that from our, our FDA studies that we've done. And of course, the first thought many of you are having are, well, what about angulation? 100%, you're correct. Uh, if you're thinking that, absolutely. These work on bite wings because we try to get for essentially perpendicular uh, source x-ray to actual uh, radiograph film uh, or sensor uh, angulation. But the more skewed your, your angle is, yes, that'll change that, that measurement. And then we've got some yellow and some red. Okay, so uh, here at Overjet, we are FDA cleared for segmentation of caries. In fact, we are the only AI company that's FDA cleared for segmentation, the opposite being bounding box detection, which all that means is we can trace where the caries is or where we think it is versus just slapping a box around it and saying somewhere in this box there's caries. Okay, so um, what, what we have here is caries outlined in several colors, okay? And we see where the enamel is visually with our eyes. And as the, uh, the caries progresses through the tooth, uh, at, at least in this model, um, now we're uh, now here looking at some experimental features that we have that are, um, you know, a little outside the scope of FDA. So we're, we're doing some beta tests with this. And what we're seeing here is that the incipient lesions are outlined in yellow in this example, and the non-incipient or larger lesions are highlighted in this red color. And so being able to visualize changes in these features can be really impactful. So let's get back to the original story here. Um, what we see here is nearly identical to what the clinician treatment planned. I think they said with, with one exception, I think the, the clinician, I, and I forget which spot, but diagnosed one additional restoration that Overjet did not. And again, Overjet's, Overjet's not saying where restorations need to occur. It's just simply saying where it thinks caries lesions are based off of its training. Okay. But now imagine that you're that dentist and you're talking to this patient and they're really upset because how dare you diagnose this much. Well, now you have this ultimate preheat, this ultimate uh, friend in the office that you can show to those patients and have them help understand what you're seeing. And then instead of just being the one that's always presenting the, the problem, you can finally be the one who's presenting the solution. And you have this assistant, this AI assistant, that's helping present those problems for you. So here's another example. Uh, this one was sent to us by a customer of ours uh, and, and very much appreciate it. So this is not my case, but this is an extra he sent. And he was super excited about this lesion that was detected by Overjet. And he said on his first read, um, he may have missed this. He said, when he turned off the AI, he had to change his contrast. And I've adjusted the contrast a little bit on it so that it's easier for us to see uh, with this lesion here. And so I just wanna show you, he said he uh, very graciously sent us some prep photos and a final finish photo, but I want you to see what this looks like. And what's really important is we can see in his prep that the caries extends beyond the DEJ. If you look on the radiograph, Overjet thinks at least outlined it right up to the DEJ, maybe slightly past it, okay? And on the x-ray, I can see maybe a little lucency just past where, where Overjet annotated it. But we need to remember that caries is often at least 25 to 30% larger in life than it looks on a radiograph. And Overjet is not accounting for theoretical what it may be. It's only annotating exactly what it sees. So just because Overjet says it's a specific size, we're looking in two dimensions at a radiograph, the real life story could be a little different, just like on, a, on your regular x-rays. And so this is the, uh, the mid-prep photo. 
uh, we've got our final prep photo and then the finished photo. I think it turned out re really nice. And so having that backup, ha having that artificial intelligence help you identify those, number one, more quickly, and number two, more completely, and help us help us not miss those, I think can be really impactful for us and for our patients. I think this is a really nice restoration for this patient. Now, artificial intelligence gives us the ability to show and not just tell. Okay, it's really beneficial for case acceptance. Now, when new clinicians use artificial intelligence for the first time, often the first thing you think of is, oh, I'm going to use this on all my new patients. I'm going to, I'm going to help me diagnose. And the reason for that is actually very sound. Because if you look at the data, okay, if you look at the nationwide case acceptance numbers, we know that established patients, so patients that you've seen before, you have an existing relationship with, they only accept treatment on average 52% of the time. So literally flip a coin and that may determine for some of your existing patients if they're gonna accept the treatment that you, that you present. But if you look at new patients, the numbers decrease significantly, okay, down to 30% average case acceptance nationwide. And if you think about what plays into case acceptance, the biggest driver, the biggest determination if that patient is gonna accept treatment is not finances, it's not fear, okay, although those things play into it, right? It's not even the smell of your office, although that may play into it if it needs to. The biggest determination if a patient's going to accept treatment is their trust in their providers and the trust that they feel that you are generating the correct treatment plan and that you have the ability to follow through on that treatment plan. And so even with our established patients, we show that the trust is still a little iffy there. And so what can we do to help increase that trust? Well, for that, let me walk you through a case study here. So this comes from, uh, and with their permission, with Jefferson Dental and Orthodontics. Okay, they're a uh, DSO based, based out of Texas. And they started a case acceptance initiative. Okay, and at their baseline, they had 34% average case acceptance. So this is a blended average, new patients, existing patients across their offices. This was their baseline case acceptance. And then they enacted their case acceptance uh, protocol. And this is the result after. Now, Overjet was not the only thing that they did here. Okay, Overjet was a, a very important piece, and we're proud to be a partner with them on this. They also did some other things. Okay, they also uh, incorporated um, intraoral scanning, case presentation coaching, things like that. And so, what they did is they married these technologies. They used these technologies, technologies, excuse me, that help their patients understand. And when a patient understands, the patient is more likely to trust. Now visualizing disease and helping your patient see something visually has been the gold standard in dentistry. And hopefully all of you are using intraoral cameras. Um, many of you are probably using intraoral scanners. Uh, so why do we do that? To show our patients what we're seeing. Well, now with artificial intelligence, we are adding one additional area that you can use to show to your patients. Now, I don't think artificial intelligence will ever replace a good intraoral photo or a, a solid full mouth scan. But what does the AI on an x-ray show you? Things typically that your intraoral photo or your arterial scan can't detect. And so it's an additional visualization tool. And so in your practice, again, not just with Overjet, but with Overjet being part of your uh, case acceptance protocols, you can see a dramatic increase in your case acceptance. Now, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about how artificial intelligence can impact uh, our periodontal disease protocols in our hygiene departments. Um, what you're seeing here is, uh, of course, an x-ray with just the bone level measurements and the calculus turned on. So I've, I've turned off all of the caries and existing restorations on this because I want to focus on these bone levels. Now, bone level measurements are an area that typically have a lot of confusion when you first start using AI. But after you implement it and you, and you kind of learn the why behind it and the, the importance of the various numbers can really fundamentally change your periodontal programs. Uh, when we look at the metrics after implementing artificial intelligence, we see in many practices the first spike in periodontal diagnosis. So let's talk about periodontal diagnosis just for a moment. Now, this isn't, this isn't meant to be a perio lecture. Uh, I, I could do an hour and a half easily purely on AI and perio. But we know that periodontal disease and the diagnosis and recognition is, is extremely important. We know that un untreated chronic periodontal disease is linked to a lot of illnesses. Uh, including increased mortality of a lot of those illnesses. And not only is it linked to these illnesses, but it's also extremely prevalent. So over 47% of adults 30 years or older have some form of periodontal disease. And if you extend our age range up to the age 70, over 71% of 70 plus year olds 
uh, have some form of periodontal disease. So not only is it linked to a lot of chronic diseases, but it's also extremely prevalent. But then if you look at our ability to detect it, let's go back to that study from 2019, looking at time pressure, clinicians detected 67% less periodontal disease related findings when under time pressure than without. Now, if you think about it, like that makes sense a little bit. I'm a restorative dentist. If I have limited time, what are the first things I look at? The restorative findings on, on that patient. Doesn't make it right. That's just typically how it is, right? I, I have limited time, so I have to prioritize. What am I gonna prioritize? So how can we help your periodontal programs? Uh, how, how can we help you recapture some of this undetected periodontal disease? Well, for that, let's talk a little bit about how periodontal disease is diagnosed today. Now, again, this isn't meant to be a staging and grading lecture, uh, but I just want to show you on the left is the criteria that's used if you're going to stage and grade your offices. And you don't need to out yourself publicly, but think in your mind, when is the last time you staged or graded a patient? If your answer is ever, congratulations, you were in the top 3% of clinicians. Uh, if your answer is, oh yeah, I really should do that sometime, that puts you with the majority of clinicians out there. The reality is staging and grading has a, has a huge potential to help our patients, but the ability for us to do this in a clinical setting with limited time is very, very challenging. And so if we look at what the ideal diagnosis consists of versus what an average diagnosis consists of, there's a big discrepancy, okay? The average diagnosis consists of, it's almost exclusively periodontal probing depths only. Um, now, some of you will take other things to account, which you should, bleeding points and uh, separation and mobility and things like that. And if you look at those things, again, you're probably in the top 25% of practices. Okay, so let's talk about not necessarily how do we stage and grade using AI, although I think there's a huge benefit of doing that, but in a more realistic clinical setting with finite time, how can AI help with that process? Um, so one thing that may be interesting uh, that you may not know is, is that periodontal disease, while the most underdiagnosed disease in dentistry, also tends to be one of the most rejected insurance claims. Okay, so that seems like an oxymoron. How are we underdiagnosing it? And then whenever we do do it, we're not getting it paid for by, by the insurance payers. Well, the reason for that is we're, we're not applying enough criteria to our diagnosis. So if we start using AI in this process and start quantifying the bone levels, this can give us the objective data that we need to determine if there's truly radiographic bone loss uh, on our patient. Okay, so to do that, let's look at this, this graph. Hopefully you guys have seen this graph before. This is made by the ADA. I, I did not create this. Okay, what I did with this though, is I took this graph and to me, this looks a little spider webby. And so I took this and I just organized it in a way that made sense to me. So this still isn't necessarily my data. This is just my way of organizing it. And if you look at the top of the graph, and I know it's small, probably hard to read. This is the patient enters your office and you do a, a, a quick evaluation and you determine, do they have so much plaque and calculus that I, I can't do an exam? If yes, you're going to do a full mouth debridement. If not, you're going to go down and, and do your oral evaluation. Okay. Now at the bottom here is the subjective criteria that the ADA listed for each one of these categories. So what if there's no or minimal inflammation? What if there's inflammation that's mild or localized or moderate to severe? And then what if there's inflammation with bone loss? Okay, and then it lists some potential procedure code uh, treatment suggestions that you could do in these cases. Okay, so what I did is I turned this subjective description on that top line and I paired that with some objective criteria that you could use to more accurately get to that treatment decision on the bottom. Okay, and so what we're looking at here is now probing depths and bone level measurements. And again, this is, this is overly simplified. There's other things we should look at. And again, staging and grading is the gold standard. So if you can do that, do that. If you feel like you can't, maybe start here and work towards that. But here we're looking at probing depths paired with bone level measurements. Okay, you cannot diagnose periodontal disease based off of bone loss alone, just as much as you can't diagnose periodontal disease based off of probing depths alone. And so this is looking at what is the combination of probing depths and bone level measurements that it would take me to get to a reasonable treatment decision, knowing that there's, of course, other, other things that you should take into account. And so now we can take an x-ray and we can help communicate those findings to our patients. Bone loss is exceptionally hard for a patient to visualize. They don't, they don't understand x-rays at all. And they bone levels look consistent to them across all the teeth, even if Overjet says it's two millimeters versus four millimeters. Okay. And so as we start implementing 
this into our periodontal protocols, what is the impact it can make? So we work with uh, Matthews Implant and Cosmetic Dentistry. They're, they're great users. They saw a 28% increase in their SRP production. Now, when I say SRP production, I, I should caveat that with just like before, production is not necessarily the goal for me, right? The goal for me is a more comprehensive diagnosis with better patient outcomes. It's hard to measure those things. The output tends to be dollars. And so that's the easiest thing to measure. So that's often what you'll see the metrics referring to. But your goal shouldn't necessarily be the dollars. That can be a goal. But your goal should be better treatment planning and more consistent patient outcomes. And this number, it may seem fantastic. This isn't even near the highest number I've seen. We, have, we had a um, customer that saw 76% increase in SRP production, you know, comparing prior to using Overjet with, with after using Overjet. And so the potential there is outstanding. And the reason why the potential is outstanding is because the level that we're doing at right now is so low. We, we set the bar so low that percentage increases look really good, um, which is unfortunate, but hopefully we can help, we can help improve that. So uh, to get this information, we do integrate with your patient management software and your imaging systems, okay? And what we do is we uh, look at a whole host of different data points within your uh, platform. So we look at pocket depths. And so we pull the actual uh, periodontal, probing, uh, periodontal chart. We look at the pocket depths. Uh, we compare that with the radiographic bone loss. We compare what was treatment plan versus what was transacted versus what was not identified by your providers. And then we can, we can call out for you potentially unmet treatment needs. And okay? now you'll see that word potentially in there again, because nothing is diagnosed until a clinician reviews and confirms all the data there. Now, what you're seeing on the image on the left is a couple of different colors. You're seeing some green bone level measurements. You're seeing red bone level measurements. Right now, we've selected the, uh, the measurement of three millimeters from CEJ to bone for it to, to turn red. We might be even a little too conservative. Really, the literature states that anything less than two is biologically normal, and anything greater than two would be considered the sort of, of radiographic bone loss. And if you look at a periapical film, and the way that AAP actually likes to look at it is as a percentage of bone loss. And I'm not sure I have an example here, but... Um, if on a periapical film, we'll calculate a percentage of bone loss by comparing the CEJ to the bone as opposed to the, the total root length down to the apex. And, and once you start looking at percentage of bone loss, then you'll be able to start really matching that perfectly with the staging and grading criteria that really looks at 0 to 15, 15 to 33, and more than 33% bone loss there. And so let me show you what that actually looks like, how we aggregate that information. So, and, and for those of you who are interested, uh, my colleague, uh, Sydney is going to be doing a full demonstration of this after my, my, my lecture here. So you get a much better view, but just briefly, I wanna show you what it looks like here. This, this is what we call the daily patients page. This is where the, uh, the data starts to be aggregated. Okay, so what you see up here on the top is it's calling out patients that are due for bite wings and due for perio charting. This doesn't necessarily take AI to recognize, but since we have the data, we figure this is helpful to call out. We can determine based off of their last periodontal probing chart, the actual date on the, the perio exam, uh, when their last uh, perio chart was taken. And we can recognize that you need to take one at a specific frequency. Same with bite wings. We can look at the transaction codes and compare those when the patient comes in with what their needs need to be. And then what I wanna show you is this findings column. Okay, now when when we first sync with practices, we pull 18 months of x-rays, every x-ray taken for the last 18 months. And we compare that with the, uh, the, the clinical data from the PMS. What I mean by that is if there's an AI finding generated, such as caries or um, you know, bone loss paired with gingival inflammation, then we will look at your transactions or treatment plans for that patient to determine if since that data was taken, have you treatment planned or transacted that specific procedure code or any treatment really on that tooth or quadrant? Okay, so anything that you see here in this findings column is AI findings that have not been treatment planned or transacted on this patient. Okay, so when it's saying scaling and root planning upper right here on this first patient at eight o'clock, think of your practice. You have a patient coming at eight o'clock. If the AI calls out scaling and root planning upper right, it means it looked at their probing depths and it found elevated probing depths. Then it looked at the uh, most recent radiographs and found bone radiographic bone loss, and that means three millimeters or more from the CEJ to bone because we're a little conservative on a recommendation. And then we compare that with the treatment plans or transactions in your practice to see if you've already treatment planned SRP or transacted it since that data was gathered. And if not, then it will show up on this daily patients page as a recommendation for that patient. And so as you're using this for your chart preps, for example, 
you can use this to determine is a prophy really the best treatment for this patient without you having to manually go and review all that data. Now, of course, to confirm the diagnosis, you're going to have to take a peek and look at the x-rays and maybe uh, spot check the patient when they're in the chair to determine if that's uh, still a, a viable recommendation and if you would clinically recommend that. But we're going to call out those patients that you need to spend uh, maybe a little bit more time reviewing that data. Okay, now, there's also restorative uh, findings called out. There's interproximal caries lesions detected by the AI. Uh, they're ready for you to confirm. So in that case, imagine this is a patient coming in for perio maintenance that's on one of their off exam schedules, meaning they're not due for an exam that day. So they come in, they see Digenis, and you reappoint them for three months later. Well, if there's an AI, a restorative AI finding there, you could flag that in your morning huddle meeting for the doctor to come in and take a peek. You page the doctor, they come in and review it. Maybe they want you to snap an updated x-ray, determine if it's something that should be treatment planned, or maybe they just want to monitor it. Uh, but now you have this ability in a more automated fashion so that you can provide more comprehensive care for your patients. So now let's talk about a little bit more about the relationship with AI and insurance. Now, I'm a restorative dentist. I've had many claims denied over the years. I have hated every one of those denials that I've gotten. So when I get to this topic, this makes some people feel uneasy because they feel like AI is going to increase their number of denials. And really what I want to show you is how your office using AI and the insurance payer using AI really helps level the playing field so that there's more consistent observation of that x-ray between the two parties. Okay, because before what would happen when you would do SRP on a patient, you would look at an x-ray and say, that looks like bone loss, and you would submit it for SRP, and then they would review it, and they would look at it, and they might say, no, that doesn't look like bone loss, and then they're going to deny it, saying no evidence of radiographic bone loss. Okay, well now, they're going to see the same AI that you're going to see on your x-ray, assuming you're using this specific AI. Okay, and so let me walk you through that, that process, what that looks like. First of all, it's really important to note that uh, no payer is or can use AI to deny claims. Artificial intelligence is only used to automatically approve claims. And the way that that works is they'll set their, their threshold, their, their criteria for when they will automatically approve a claim. And so if you look at this example here, this is actually a screenshot I took from a payer portal um, that's using Overjet. And they're looking at the bone level measurements for a specific quadrant to determine if they can adjudicate an SRP claim. And so the data that they require or some of the criteria is that there must be evidence of radiographic bone loss. And so what does that, what does that look like, right? Well, now it's not just a clinician looking at it and say, yeah, I don't think there's any there. Well, now we know precisely within an accuracy of plus or minus 0.3 millimeters, what the bone level measurement is from the CJ to the bone or percentage of bone loss if we're looking at a periapical film. And now we can, uh, we can set a consistent criteria. And, and most of the payers are in line with the literature that states that less than two is normal. Okay, so some payers will, will use 1.8 millimeters, some will use two, some might use 2.1. But in general, you'll have a consistent criteria set there so that you can know on your x-ray ahead of time if this meets the criteria. Now, let's caveat that with, you shouldn't treatment plan things because you think insurance will pay for it. And you shouldn't treatment plan thing or not treatment plan things because you don't think they'll pay for it. It's up to us as clinicians to come up with the most comprehensive, appropriate diagnosis for our patient, and then ultimately work with their, their providers or payers to, to help get that um, paid for in their favor. But now that we have this information, okay, we have evidence-based criteria that's being applied. Um, and there's a lot of potential here. So th there's a lot of, you know, we did a, an analysis with a large DSO and a major, major payer, and we found that 40% of claims that came in were missing documentation. They, they just didn't have full, they either didn't have probing depths uh, with it, or they didn't send a full, full mouth series or whatever criteria that the payers were wanting, 40% of them didn't have the information. Well, how does your office find out about that now? You submit the claim and within a few weeks or a month, you get a denial back or a request for more information saying, we don't have enough information. And so then you send it in, then it takes a few more weeks and then you'll get your final determination on that. Well, imagine if you could have a platform that would flag that in real time and say missing documentation. Now that's not in our platform right now, so don't sign up for that reason, but that's what we're working towards, what we call point of care adjudication, or at least point of care assisted adjudication, where we can flag some of those things in real time. And maybe even at some point, and I think this will be a reality sooner than most expect, at some point you could get a real time approval of a claim while the patient's in the chair. Okay, now you, may, you wouldn't get the denial by the patient's in the chair necessarily. It might say more information needed or clinical review needed. But for the majority of claims, you could get that while the patient's there. And so the peace of mind that, that gives the patient in your office and the expedited claim payment, I think there's a, a huge potential for synergies and better relationships between payers and providers. 
So uh, we're almost out of time. I want to make sure we leave enough time for questions, but I do want to talk a little bit about what's next, what's coming down the pipeline. So right now, everything that we've been talking about has been two dimensional. We've been talking about bite wings, uh, talked about PAs, we talked about uh, panoramic images. And I think there's still a lot of territory left to conquer. And, and I wouldn't say we've necessarily perfected anything at this point. I think we're, we're moving in the right direction, but I think we still have uh, improved accuracy we can achieve and more model development that we can achieve and, and more comprehensive recommendations that we can achieve. But beyond that, there's a whole world of, of 3D images. And I apologize if like this image blew up a little, a little fuzzy. But imagine what we could do with AI on three-dimensional images. And that may start on two-dimensional photographs, which are more representative of, of the three-dimensional world. But then imagine intraoral scanning and cone beam data. Um, you know, for example, I, I have a theory that I, I haven't tested yet, but uh, it's in progress. Could we one day retire the perio probe? Right, right now, overjet's looking at heart tissue. You still have to perio probe. In fact, if you don't perio probe, overjet won't recommend any SRP for you because it needs that data point. Okay. Well, what if we could compare soft tissue information from an intraoral scan with hard tissue data from an intraoral X-ray? Could we infer with a reasonable degree of accuracy a probing depth? Um, you know, right now our accuracy is is only plus or minus a millimeter. At least that's the expectation when I was in dental school. Uh, you needed to be plus or minus a millimeter of, of whatever the actual was. Well, I'm confident we could get closer than plus or minus a millimeter using artificial intelligence. So I think there's a lot of synergies and then a whole host of other pathologies and things that we could start getting into. Uh, pediatric caries detection. Uh, we are in late stage development of our pediatric models um, that are actually trained on primary and mixed dentition. And these will be, to my knowledge, will be the first of its kind, truly trained on pediatric teeth and being, being able to automatically number and label pediatric and mixed dentition teeth accurately when you have some permanent and some primary teeth. Uh, I've seen the model in action, it's fantastic. Um, so I think this will be a, a big area where this can help pediatric dentists who are uh, maybe in the operating room wanna make sure that you're comprehensive in your diagnosis while there's a whole host of things going on. Um, or, or maybe you're just a general dentist who's, uh, you know wants this in your practice because you see enough pediatric patients. And then the last thing I think, which can be really interesting is, you know I mentioned getting more comprehensive in our recommendations. Right, right now, artificial intelligence is very transactional. And what I mean by that is you take an x-ray, we'll compare that x-ray with your treatment plans and transactions, then we'll determine if there's a recommendation. And then you'll take another x-ray and we'll do that same thing on each x-ray. Well, how about we make this think more like the clinician thinks? And instead of looking at each x-ray and making a recommendation, recommendation, what if we could look at all the x-rays together and compare the PA with the bite wing and multiple bite wings and determine which was the better angulation, right? The things that I do when I'm looking at x-rays with a patient. And then not even stopping at that, what if I could bring in other information like their medical history or their, their record of how often they come in for appointments and how often they miss their appointments and then bring that in with the third dimension and their, their medical history. And then instead of just recommending something because it meets our threshold, what if we could recommend things because it meets that patient's needs? And we know that because we have enough data to show all of these things playing together. You know, think of this as a, a carries risk assessment, but a comprehensive patient uh, oral health score. Um, you know, I, I think the opportunity there is is fantastic. And this is what really excites me about, about AI and dentistry. Right now we're doing some incredibly fascinating things. We're at cutting edge. This is things that have never been done in dentistry before, but it's the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more artificial intelligence in front of us than there is behind us. And, you know, I'm excited that you guys let me uh, speak for a, a couple of minutes to you tonight on it. So with that, if you do want more information, you're welcome to scan this QR code. Again, there will be a demo here in just a moment, but uh, before we pass it over there, Dr. Uh, Rowling, if you're there, I saw your camera turn off. If there's any questions that have come in, I'm happy to take any questions. We have some questions. I do also wanna remind the folks that are on their phone, they can tap on the banner at the top of the screen and it will also take them to Overjet and that um, URL connected to the uh, QR code. So we do have questions. Um, Rebecca would like to know, can it find abnormalities like an infection? Yeah, so uh, I had a slide on there that showed the periapical radiolucency detection. So I think maybe that's what you're referring to. So the answer is uh, that model is in beta. We have it live with several customers right now. It's not spread throughout the entire platform, um, but it should be shortly and it's pending FDA review at the moment. Um, so it's, uh, it's coming very quickly. If you're talking about some other pathologies like odontomas and, you know, meloblastomas and things, we do not have that capability at the moment. Uh, I think the FDA hurdle on that will be a little bit higher, but it's something we've certainly talked internally about and are interested in working on. 
Terrific. We have a question here from Dr. Brower. What are the documents substantiating FDA approval? What are the documents? Is that was that the question? That's correct. What are the documents? Yeah, so FDA approval, uh, it, it, those are public records. You can go to the FDA's website, you can find all those records. Uh, so for all the AI companies out there, those are, those are all public records um, showing what the approvals are, um, specifically what they're approved for. Um, so yeah, that's all public information. You're welcome to access that on the FDA's website. Question from Rebecca again, since it is FDA approved, does that mean insurance companies have to accept the readings from it? Uh, I don't know that I could make an insurance company do anything. Uh, the, the, the payers who are using AI have a very uh, detailed decision tree of how they use the AI and implement it. Um, if the payer is not using AI, we do see a lot of success with those payers viewing the AI findings. We have a way to export the x-ray with the AI findings on there. Um, and I have definitely seen payers using those as, uh, as evidence in their adjudication process. I wouldn't say they have to by any means, um, but certainly I've seen that, that many do. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Bahari. The 2D images don't show the entire structure. Obviously, the angle of the X-ray beam doesn't completely show all aspects. How does AI work with a 3D image? Yeah, great question. So the answer right now is the, like we really don't at the moment. Right now, everything that I showed you in the platform is two-dimensional, and you're 100% spot on. Two dimensions is not the full story. Uh, so we interpret the two-dimensional x-ray the same way or similar to how a clinician interprets the two-dimensional image, right? So you look at it and you try to infer your best estimation to what's happening based off of that image. Now, as clinicians, we have the advantage that the patient's typically sitting in a chair and we can poke it and feel the tooth and look at it and look for color change and things. So that's why we're an adjunctive tool, um, you know, not creating the diagnosis for you. Okay. Question from uh, Dr. Smith about cost. And I would remind everyone after your presentation, we're going to have a product demonstration here. And I think some of those questions will be answered, but do you want to address any of that, Dr. Colts? Yeah, fortunately I am not in sales, so I don't know the cost, uh, even if you ask me. I do know that there's a discount for this group and Sydney will yes. uh, absolutely give that to you during her demonstration. There is a discount, so please stay on, and uh, Sydney will definitely share that with you. For Dr. Zweibel, if a patient sees an orange lesion, how can we tell them to trust us instead of the AI when we recommend to treat it? I wonder if in the future you can break it down into greater or less than. Yeah, so let me talk to you about how it is now, and then I'll talk to you about how, how, what we're working towards. So right now, I'm very clear when I talk with patients that this artificial intelligence is not telling us what we need to treat and what we don't need to treat. Right? I have treated many an incipient lesion in my career without any guilt because I know the patient needed that particular lesion treated. And you should also not feel guilty for treating a, an orange lesion. Right? All that is is a size determination. It's saying, according to the AI, it doesn't appear to have crossed the DEJ threshold. You saw that example from the, the clinical, um, the mid-prep photo, that that one was yellow, but it definitely crossed the DEJ. So in that aspect, you just have a conversation with your patient that uh, this is uh, based, it's showing you the size, but this one is still definitely needed to be treated. So, and I typically find patients are, are receptive, it just depends on how you present that. Um, the second piece of that is what are we working towards? We're actually in the next couple of months going to have a, a, a big update to the way we visualize caries. And I think it's going to be even more clear on being able to look at those incipient lesions. And then we will have the ability just to hit a button and just have them all be red, the same color, so that if that is a concern for you, um, you wouldn't even have to deal with that at that point. So stay tuned, that'll be coming. Dr. Titus would like to know, to know can the period annotation account for baseline probing man, uh, measurements? Okay, can you repeat the first part of that question? Can the period annotation account for baseline probing measurements? Dr. Titus, if you're there, do you wanna clarify a little bit and we'll come back to you? I'm thinking maybe maybe he's he or she is asking if um, like you take a full mouth series of X-rays, you get the bone level measurements. Can that count as your baseline probing? I'm going to assume that's your question. That sounds like the answer. It. Yeah, the answer is no. These bone level measurements are never a replacement for probing depths. Okay, remember we're looking at hard tissue. You might have uh, a ton of bone loss. You might have a five millimeter bone level measurement and a two millimeter pocket, or you might have a seven millimeter pocket and normal bone level measurement. Right, so they're not necessarily correlated, although there is an association between the two typically. Um, but we're showing you bone levels, not probing dose. 
Okay, I think that's what what uh, Dr. Marshall Titus meant, perio annotation. Um, for Dr. Gaba, so for probing, it's four millimeters or more for SRP. What's the number for overjet? So SR, for the SRP recommendation, overjet uses four or more millimeters on the probing depth, paired with a three or more mil, millimeter bone level measurement. So yeah, on the probing, it's four millimeters. Okay. And um, we have Dr. Patty Jenkins. Some, some insurance companies are now requiring notation of what local anesthetic was used and how long the procedure took when determining coverage and payment. Do you have any comments about that, Dr. Colts? Uh, I, so I'll admit, I don't work on the insurance side of the overjet business. Uh, I have my counterpart, Dr. Chris Balvin is our VP of clinical affairs who does much of that. But to my knowledge, from my conversations with him, I have, I have not heard that that's widespread uh, on the decision tree for uh, those companies using AI, but I'm certainly happy to look into that. And if you want to get my contact information and shoot me an email, I'm happy to follow up with you on that. Dr. Marshall Titus, once more, does the production increase equate to increased insurance reimbursement? Does production increase relate to, uh, I, I'm certain there is a correlation there uh, but between the two. I think when you're diagnosing more, more comprehensively, you're going to see uh, overall the production metrics in your office increase. And if you're a PPO driven office, that's certainly going to play into it. We have a question here from uh, Mariana Diaz. She's a dental hygienist. So Overjet automatically detects the bone levels. Is there a report we can print to support a pretreatment estimate? Yes, yeah, so you can export the full mouth series. Uh, you can export each of the images with the annotations on there. Um, I think that that's a newer feature in the product. So probably we can make that a little bit more user friendly to have that be all all automated, but you can, on an individual x-ray basis, export those with the findings. Then we're working on an update to make that a little bit smoother for you. We have a question from Dr. Kablonski. Do you still need to do a physical perio probing? Yes, 100% yes. And from uh, Dr. Gaba again, can Overjet do CEPH analysis or being used for orthodiagnosis? Not yet. However, I think that's a really interesting use case to automate that, that, uh, you know, we've certainly talked about internally, but not at the moment, no. For uh, Dr. Centeno, so if you are submitting to insurance with AI, I think I'm understanding that both you and the insurance company need to be utilizing the same AI. So six out of the 10 largest payers in the country are using Overjet to process their AI, regardless if your practice is looking at the AI or not. So... Um, there are over 100 million patient lives who are uh, have a plan covered by a payer using artificial intelligence. And again, your payers are already looking at the information regardless if you are. So in my mind, it makes sense for you to see what they're saying. This is from Dr. Sumar. Does the bone loss feature work for radiographs of dental implants as well? Yeah, you know that what's what's interesting is it does. Uh, we've, we've got a, a pretty good model that can detect the... Uh, the, the edge of the, the, uh, the abutment margin down to the crestal bone. But what's really interesting actually is it kind of taught itself that we, we weren't specifically training it on implants. It just inferred based off of its training on teeth. So we are working on improving the accuracy on that. But uh, yes, you will get bone level measurements around implants. We do not include those in our recommendation for SRP. We let you use the implant bone level to determine that, but we only count natural teeth when we're determining for SRP needs. From Dr. Malmgren, is the software compatible with EagleSoft, Dentrix, Epic, Epic, et cetera? So we have integrations with all of the major players. Um, you mentioned Epic. We are working on our Epic integration. We actually have a lot of interest from universities that are using Epic on integrating this into their dental curriculum. Uh, so that is on our roadmap. We're not currently compatible, but Dentrix, um, Open Dental, um, EagleSoft, uh, you know, all, all the big players, Denicon, uh, were compatible with all of those. From uh, Dr. Simmons, are you familiar with second opinion software and how does it compare to Overjet? I, I am familiar with it. Uh, great, great question. There's, uh, you know, some similarities in that we're putting AI on dental x-rays. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the really, the, the big difference uh, or couple is number one, we're the only one uh, FDA cleared for carry segmentation. So I think you may see some of that in their product, but they actually are only FDA cleared for bounding box detection. Um, and then we are cleared as a primary or concurrent read device. They are cleared as a second read device. 
Um, we are also a high trust certified company for, so that's a rigorous IT uh, security audit we had to go through for our, our HIPAA compliance. We're the only company high trust certified. Um, it, I could keep going on, but I, I do want to emphasize that I actually appreciate that there's multiple players in the market because I think it makes for better innovation for you mm -hmm. as a customer and it keeps your prices down. So um, you know, I certainly appreciate the, the other companies out there. Uh, Dr. Suji would like to know, how does your AI software accurately measure the length of objects in dental x-rays and is a reference length required? It seems that AI software for panoramic x-ray images is also being developed, but has it been commercialized as a product? So we actually hold a patent on pixel to millimeter conversion without an assistance device on a bite wing x-ray, which sounds very specific. But what it means is on a bite wing, we can with a reasonable degree of accuracy by detecting which sensor was, was used. And we can do that by some mathematics using pixel counts and things. Um, we can factor in the inherent mag magnification factor to get that measurement. And so we're only going to show the millimeter metric on a bite wing x-ray. We'll never show that on a PA because it's technically infeasible right now. Um, but uh, on a bite wing and our accuracy is plus or minus 0.3 millimeters on it. So uh, we're only right now showing that for the bone level measurements, but we are working internally on a tool that you could use to measure point to point on any bite wing and get plus or minus 0.3 millimeters uh, of a measurement. Um, but yeah, I don't understand necessarily all the technical stuff behind it because people a lot smarter than I developed it, but uh, I, I know we have that bad. So. Well, Dr. Schlossman has a question here uh, about periodontal staging with radiographs. Any comments that would need the full route to determine a percentage of RBL. So how accurate or acceptable are the bite wing x-rays as shown for staging? And that will be our last uh, question that we're taking. So you say how, how accurate, there, there's a couple of things. If you're talking about on, on getting claims paid, payers will accept uh, bite wing measurements or periapicals. You are hundred percent right. Staging and grading as of the latest guidelines only talk about percentage of bone loss. Now I did go through and I, I looked at the average root length for each tooth. And I calculated based off of the average root length, what, what distance from CEJ to the crest of bone would you need to fall within the less than 15%, 15 to 33 or greater than 33. And the numbers fall pretty darn close to two to four millimeters, four to six and six plus using average root lengths. But uh, if you want to be hundred percent in line with the guidelines, you should use periapical films and look at percentage of bones. Terrific. Well, we are ready to go ahead and bring Sydney on. Would you like to stop your screen share? I know that she'll be um, screen sharing. And um, oh, for everyone is who is here, please stay on for the product demonstration. Um, at the top of the screen, you'll see a blue banner. And I see many of you went to it. If you tap on that, that is a landing page. And we are going to go ahead now with the product demonstration. I do need to say for AGD Pace, it is not required for CE credit. But this is where you're going to get your uh, questions answered about the product specifically, pricing, and that sort of thing. So I'd like to welcome Sydney Chick. She is the account executive here for Overjet. And Sydney, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rob. And then thank you, Dr. Rowling, for a really awesome introduction. So I'm excited to walk you all through the Overjet platform. I realize that it is rather late for our East Coast uh, members joining. Um, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. A lot of it, I'm, I appreciate Rob giving a quick introduction. So I'm really going to just go through how it would look like if you all had it in your practices. So again, we'll visualize this if you were a dentist, if you were a hygienist, if you were a, an assistant and how you can apply this into your day-to-day -day workflow. So when you're looking at radiographs here um, with Overjet, as Rob mentioned, uh, we're analyzing for several things. So when you're in your radiographs for your patients, you'll see anything in blue is going to be measuring or, excuse me, um, identifying previous restorations. We're going to be looking for subgingival calculus here in the tangerine boxes. We have our incipient lesions here in tangerine and then those larger lesions as well that are highlighted in red. And then, of course, here you can see our bone level measurements so measuring from crestal bone to CEJ. Super simple, we can turn everything on or off. On the right hand side, you have the functionalities if we really just wanted to focus on, um, let's say, potential restorative work that might need to be completed today so we can turn off the bone levels. If we wanted to focus on potential perio um, analysis and disease detection, we can look here. So you have full customization here and very similar to what you would see if you had um, your normal image software, native, native image software that you use. So you have rotation, flip, 
brightness, gammas, contrast, and all of those amazing features here. So easiest way to work throughout the practice so that you can really showcase what you wanna to show to your patient while they're in the chair is to utilize these little eyeball buttons here on the right-hand side. So how does this really work in your day-to-day? -day? We take all of this information that the AI has analyzed. We first initially do an 18-month historical analysis. So when you initially install with Overjet, we're gonna run that 18-month historical analysis. So we're gonna take your radiographs read and analyze those with um, the artificial intelligence. We'll cross-reference that based on what we see in the practice management software and deliver what we call our daily patients dashboard. So we really emphasize this for a calibration tool. It's a great way to emphasize um, getting your team together in your morning huddles. We can see on the top left-hand side here, we have patients that are due for a new set of bite wings and those that are needing an updated perio chart. So these are really time delegators so that we know we have to delegate the time to complete these tasks for the day. And then on the right-hand side, more specifically and most excitingly, is the periodontal conditions and the potential caries. So these are the areas where Overjet has identified potential periodontal patients or patients with potential caries that have not been treatment planned before. So we've analyzed in the radiographs for the potential problem areas and identified that there did not have a corresponding treatment plan with them. And so if we scroll down here, this is all going to be a live real-time analysis. So you don't have to do anything. Workflow ultimately stays the exact same in your practice, which is amazing. As Dr. Rob actually emphasized earlier on in his presentation, we really want this to have no interruption to your daily workflow. We really want it to be more positively impactful so that we can be more efficient, but then also be most readily um, prepared to show our patients what we see clinically when we're going to go in and do our diagnosis. So um, what we'll do is do that virtual um, or that bridge from your practice management imaging software. It's going to be a live sync to Overjet. So Overjet is going to live as a cloud-based, web-based solution. Ultimately, the only thing you have to do is just look at the x-rays, which is really awesome. So we're going to auto-import all of those radiographs into Overjet, and you're going to have your like real-time analysis. So for example, you have your first patient here. It's actually notating that she is a new patient. We can see this little yellow star. And based on her first visit here, she was due for a set of bite wings. It has now populated green because we have captured those bite wings. And based on um, the AI analysis, we can see that this patient not only has interproximal lesions, but Overjet has identified and recommended potential two surface, three surface, and preventative incipient lesions just to review. So when you think about that morning huddle, these are not things that we want to bog down the meeting, you know, spend 20, 30 minutes in the morning, you know, talking through this, but it is a really great way to say, you know, these are the patients that we have coming in. These are the potential outstanding treatments that we may see here, but ultimately it's a really great way to get the team on the same page before a patient even comes into the practice. So I think we had a question earlier on in the presentation that was asking, you know, can we use this for potentially sending in to get estimates? Could we possibly use this? Absolutely. So what we're going to do is you're going to have access to all of these radiographs as long as you already have these patients' radiographs before they even come in. So for example, you can see this patient is high caries prone. We've got the bone level measurement. So you can absolutely use this export function on the top left-hand side with the findings and then submit that with the claim for this patient. So really easy process here. You're ultimately going to be sending the same claim submission that you normally would, but now you have this really powerful um, tool that's going to have these amazing annotations to then help justify that. So something amazing that Overjet does here is what we use is called a DMF value. So you can see on tooth number three, we have a decayed, missing, or filled percentage of 2%. So that's just identifying how much of the tooth structure may have decayed, missing, or fractured anatomy. So it's a great way to one, maybe monitor change over time. So if a patient, we put a watch on this, they ultimately come back in six to eight months for their next cleaning. If on tooth number 29, it went from a DMF of three to six, really fantastic way to say patient, you know, we see that there's active decay. This has grown from three to 8%. This is why treatment might be necessary. But where Overjet really takes this to the next level is helping identify patients that might actually need further restorative analysis. So jumping from the daily patients dashboard, 
we actually create two buckets um, of all your patients in your practice. So we're going to have a perio and restorative, which is going to contain all of those recommendations that Overjet identified. So keep in mind here, these are actually all patients that had something that Overjet identified within the radiographs, but also identified was not treatment planned for previously from the patient's ledger. So we're actually going to review their history back to three years to make sure that this is the most up-to-date information and most relevant information. So in this first bucket, just to give you all a breakdown, this is actually identifying patients that might likely require a crown based on that DMF score. So as Rob actually mentioned in his presentation as well, we do err on the side of being more conservative. So we're putting these patients that have a DMF score of 50% that they could likely require a crown. And then you can see here, we're also identifying patients that have already had previous restorative work. So a crown with recurrent decay, restorations with recurrent to carry, recurrent carries. And then ultimately we can click these virtual sticky notes is what I like to call them. And it's gonna load the list of patients here at the bottom that all meet that criteria. So as we're potentially doing a quick chart audit of the practice reviewing patients, you can see there's a list of all the patients, when their next appointment is, which quadrant, and then ultimately which tooth or teeth might correspond with the recommendation card up here. And so to quickly jump, we're also gonna have our period dashboard. And I want to spend an extra minute here because I think this is the most exciting. I think this is the one that most practices really implement and use more than anything. And it really becomes um, our hygienist crowd favorite, mainly because of this scaling and route planning. So in this first bucket here, we're actually identifying patients that might need scaling and route planning because of several criteria. So if we click this little question mark, this will be our reminder to then remember why they fell into this bucket. So in this bucket specifically, these patients might be in need of scaling and root planning because they have probing depths, which we auto imported from the practice management software of greater than or equal to four millimeters. They also have bone levels that are greater than three millimeters on the same tooth. And that bone level measurement is auto populated by Overjet. We then cross reference into the practice management software and also identify that these patients never had any scaling and root planning in the past. So they ultimately fell into this bucket because we know that patients need to have signs of bleeding in um, for their pockets. And then ultimately that elevated bone level showing that there's signs of bone loss here. And then ultimately we break this down into different stages. So we have our possible SRPs. These are patients that have the same criteria, but on different teeth. And then second stage, and of course, miscoded perio maintenance. So these are ones that are still on a profi, but really should be on a 4910. So a really amazing way to just really see the most impactful insights that you have for your practice from the bird's eye view. So these would ultimately be all the patients that meet that criteria. And then we have the same functionality to review here more in depth. So we can see all our patients that are under this potential need of scaling and root planing, when they might be coming back in, if they have a single quad, potentially multiple quads, the severity level of that imported perio chart that we auto pulled into here, which teeth have the elevated bone levels, the calculus, and then of course, their corresponding images here, which is really amazing. And then last major feature that I like to jump into is our patient search. So if I called in and said, doctor, my tooth is hurting, something feels like it's falling out, the easiest way to find that patient if they're not on the schedule for the day is right here in the patient search. So you can find them through their patient ID date of birth and or um, in this, what we call global overjet search here. So that's really your quick view of the overjet dashboard. Where most practices live and breathe is really here on this daily patients dashboard. This is the best way to see all your patients coming in, all those insights that overjet has delivered and really helping drive that operational efficiency um, that we're looking for. But I will pause here. I'm sure we might have some questions. So as I do that, I will pull up this other tab. So if you have other questions, if you're looking to see um, more about this, really get to spend about 30 minutes or so with one of us here at Overjet, we'd be happy to walk you through a demo. So please um, use this QR code to do so. Um, but before we actually open up to questions, Dr. Rowling, I will mention the special pricing because I know yes. everybody's probably very anxious for it. So I almost forgot about it. But I'll start here. Overjet typically is $5.99 per month with an initial install fee of $1,500.
What we're doing for all of our CE attendees tonight is actually fully waiving that implementation fee. So mm -hmm. no fee to get started. And it's $549 um, per month. And that includes your 18-month historical analysis. That includes all of your real-time x-ray analysis, continued support. We're going to get the offices trained. We'll get you all excited. And then we'll continue to help drive and make this impactful. So $549 a month and nothing to get started. That's great. I uh, hope everybody will scan the code. And um, if you, the code is not showing, please tap on the banner at the top of the screen where you can reach out to uh, Sydney or Dr. Colts um, and the team at Overjet. And there's someone asking if you could repeat that uh, again. The um, oh, the pricing. offer. Mm -hmm. So the pricing um, is $549 per month. And there's no installation fee, so no startup fee. And to just put that in relative terms, it's typically $599 a month with a one-time installation fee of $1,500. So you're saving that $1,500 to get started. And then we're also reducing that monthly fee um, by $50 to, for your appreciation for you guys joining us this evening. As Rob said, I know we're missing some football games, maybe some baseball games. Um, all the good things this evening. Well, we have a great crowd here. So I just posted what that offer looked like. It's um, normally $599. They're going to say $50 a month, bringing it down to $549. And the $1,500 um, installation fee is waived. So you're saving $600 for the year plus $1,500. So you're saving $2,100. That is awesome. Um, we do have some questions for you both. So let's see. Um, the first one, how long does the initial 18 month analysis of radiographs take? So we will do the installation up front. So typically, um, I, I guess I'll give a quick overview of how you would get started with Overjet. It's really simple. We would link with your smart IT guys. They would link up with our engineers. We would actually run that 18 month analysis um, when we do the install. Typically we say two to three business days just because we're gathering lots of practice information to do that. We give it time to validate and then you're ready to go and that's when we'll get ready for training. So we'll do that on the front end and then all of your real-time insights. So as you capture new images, that's all in 60 seconds or less. So it's real time by the time you hang up the sensor cord and you've completed your um, new set of images, you'll have all of the annotations there chair side with the patient. Terrific. And I do want to remind, remind folks to tap on the banner at the top of the screen, you can bookmark that URL. So if this is information that you wanna take back to your practice tomorrow, you won't lose it, just um, bookmark it uh, for later to share. There is a question here from Kenneth Greenberg, Dr. Greenberg, on X-ray read and in parentheses 74, he noted caries on the mesial of 31, but not noted by AI. I don't doubt it. Remember, this is uh, this is trained by dentists, so this is your aggregate output of like a what a hundred dentists would look at and see. Uh, you will AI is not a hundred percent accurate. It's going to miss things that you would pick up, and it might pick up things that you wouldn't think it needed to. So uh, we use real world examples. That's a real world sampling of what it'll look like. Question from Dr. Hoverman: How does someone get involved with development? Uh, so if you go to Overjet's LinkedIn page, there's uh, a list of hiring needs that they have. And if you have an interest, just browse those uh, those positions and see if one you think would suit you. Okay. We've got a couple more questions that came in here. Question about the monthly no initiation fee. Um, and they're asking, is it month to month? So I... I I'm assuming, do they mean that they're, are they locked in for a contract or what uh, the length of duration of that contract would be? Um, correct. So we do do an annual commitment, but with the monthly billing. Um, and a big piece of that is one, you get locked into that great price point. So you're not having to face some of the price increases. And ultimately, our goal here is to give you a product that we can work closely with to get consistent feedback and constant implementation. So we do see great results in, um, by having that long term commitment here with us. But you will have the monthly billing. Can it detect burnished calculus? 
so yes, I mean, to a degree, it depends on how far out from the root surface it, it protrudes. But yes, it'll still detect it. I've seen it pick those up very well, actually. Question about compatibility with Curve Hero software. Danielle, I'll let you take that one. I'm not sure. Yep, so not yet. Um, as Rob mentioned, we're compatible with lots of the big players out there. So EagleSoft, Dentrix, um, Open Dental, Denicon. We're actively starting our integrations with CareStack. We'll have some others in the pipeline. Curve is also one of those. So it'll really just be a waiting game. But if it's something you're still interested in, I always encourage learning about the product because if you're excited, you'll be one of the first to be able to access it. So definitely if it's something, even if you're not compatible, we'll get there eventually. We're not saying no to any of them. It's just the time constraints to actually get there. So not yet with Curve, but it will be coming soon, something that um, we've already discussed on our side. Okay, we have a question here. Does Overjet work with vertical bite wings? It, it does, yes. Very, just the same as it would with regular bite wings. Uh, we love vertical bite wings because often if you don't take those, we don't see the crestal bone, and so you get less information. So absolutely. And we have a question here. Does it pick data and send to Overjet for more AI improvement? So we do not, um, because our models are FDA trained, we don't continuously take your x-rays and, and continually feed uh, the models. What we do is there's a trash can icon next to uh, your ability to like toggle a finding on or off. You can delete a finding. And then what we do is we aggregate those deletions. And as a, the clinical team, we review those periodically and we send those ones that you've deleted that we are on 100% agreement with back to the ML team and they use those during the retraining. So. We use your feedback, but it's not instantaneous, if that makes sense. We have a question here. When will the pediatric program be available? Really Ooh. soon. I, I hope. <laughs> I validated the models last week for production. So it's, uh, it takes a couple of sprints, a couple of weeks for the engineering team to get them put in. We're releasing it on a beta rollout first to some select customers while it's going through the FDA approval process. Um, if you're interested in getting to be part of that beta uh, team, you can reach out to Sydney and she can see if we can get you on the list, but uh, probably for everybody, probably by the next couple of months. Question here um, about, is there a promo code or can they just go to the link uh, regarding the special pricing? Yep, that link has a unique ID to it. So we'll be able to know that you came in through um, this e-course. If you happen just to be browsing on the Overjet website, um, do recommend to either myself or whoever you may meet within um, the Overjet team. So you attended this CE event and will know um, to offer that special promotion. But if you use that link at the top, that has a unique identifier for you all. Question here about um, using it on an arrest and filled pocket. Um, I, I don't think that would make a difference. My, to my knowledge, arrest in is not... Uh, Radio pick. I'm right. trying to think back to the last time I used a resin. So I don't I don't think that shows up on an X-ray, so I don't think it should make a difference. Lots of thank yous here. Any other questions? I think we reached the end of the internet, Sydney. You were comprehensive. <laughs> and so was Dr. Colts. Um, how would they reach either one of you through Overjet or what's the best approach? So if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody. My email is very easy to remember. It's just rob, R-O-B, at overjet.ai. You're welcome to shoot me an email. And if I can't help you, I can point you to the right to the right way. A question here. When the pediatric program becomes available, will it be part of the program for 549? Is it going to be 549 forever? Um, so questions around that. And questions around um, insurers. Which insurers use Overjet? Um, I can quickly answer the, will it be a part of that? Yep, so current um, additional findings or new updates, they will currently be rolled into that. You'll also be into that long-term commitment of at least 12 months, so you'll have that forever. Unfortunately, that's above my pay grade to promise forever pricing. I wish I could have that control as I am on the sales side, um, but for the commitment of your 12 month um, term, you will be in that 549. And then if there's other things that come down, then there might be subject to change, but you'll always have the option to decide if that's something you want to continue with. 
Terrific. Yeah. Any closing remarks before we um, adjourn here? I think there was a question on the payers uh, that are using it. Uh, yes. Many of the payers we have non-disclosure agreements with, so I, I can't just like give you the list, but I can tell you Guardian and Humana have both announced publicly on their own LinkedIn pages that, uh, that they use us. And so if you think of who in your mind would be the six out of the 10 largest or pick your top 10 largest, we're in the majority of those. So um, yeah, so that that's a good list to start with at least. Have you interfaced with any of the public health departments? Uh, we've had some interaction with some um, like Department of Veterans Affairs uh, related uh, clinics. We've had some uh, clinics that are more interested in like total body health um, that are like using Epic and, and they're doing like medical dental integrations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the public health clinics are use uh, some of them, at least that we've talked to use platforms that we're not yet compatible with. So there has been a lot of interest there, but um, you know, kind of waiting for development on this. I know a few have gone to Epic. Uh, the one that I left went to Epic. Um, just wondered in, you know, Native Health, Indian Health Services and so forth. All right. Well, I thank you both for being here. This is an excellent presentation. And I know that um, the attendees have asked great questions. They've showed so much interest. And I'd like to thank Dr. Robert Colts and Sydney Chick for their excellent presentation. Again, and all of you, for taking the time to join us this evening. We will have the recording available later this evening, and I know it's late for you on the East Coast, uh, but if you care to review it or share it with your colleagues, it will be there as well as um, last month's presentation. And I wanna thank you both for being here. We're going to go ahead and close, and we will have the CE quiz sent for you in about four minutes, but if you log out, you will be redirected to the quiz as well. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. You. Thank you. It.